Welcome to the Sales Whisper Podcast, Session 42. Your ship has set sail. Welcome to the Sales Podcast, Session 42. This is Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Uh, we've got a great guest on today, Mr. Josh Ship, whom I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, if you're listening to Session 41 uh, with Pat Flynn, that I'm adding a few uh, new little components, uh, kind of like on you know, Joel Olstein's uh, kind of have our entrepreneur mantra, which I'm working on, and I'll read that to you in just a second, and, and as well as a little daily funny uh, for the podcast. So the entrepreneur's mantra is this, today is my day. I work diligently towards my goals, which are bigger than me. I bite off more than I can chew because only then will I truly know my current limits. And surpassing them becomes my new goal for today. Through education, accountability partners, and bold, decisive action, today will be better than yesterday, and tomorrow will be better yet. I'm ready to produce. I always say that uh, education, uh, knowledge, uh, training like this uh, is only good if you put it into action. So put it into action. Um, today's joke is two atoms are walking down the street together. The first atom turns and says, hey, you just stole an electron from me. Are you sure? Asked the second atom, to which the first atom replies, yeah, I'm positive. How you like that? All right, so Josh Shipp, he is uh, actually a client of mine. Uh, I've done a little work for him uh, on the Infusionsoft side of the house and some marketing. Uh, but he is uh, a former at-risk foster kid turned teen advocate. Uh, his TV series, Teen Trouble, uh, you can see on A&E and Lifetime, documented his work with teens in crisis. Uh, he's the author of The Teen's Guide to World Domination. He was named a CNN Young Person Who Rocks and was listed on Inc. Magazine's 30 Under 30 list. Uh, so... We're not going to be talking about at youth teens. Uh, we're going to be talking about his story uh, and how he has built a successful business and built his brand coming from the foster care system. Uh, but his mission statement or tagline is he helps adults understand teens and teens understand themselves. Uh, we got pretty deep on this, so make sure you're somewhere you can focus. Uh, you can take notes if you're driving. Uh, you will probably have to hit rewind a few times um, because there's some good info in here. So enjoy my interview with Josh Ship. Josh Ship, welcome to the Sales Whisper Podcast. How are you, Wes? My good man. Nice to be talking to you. Hey, you know, I was I was doing some research and just literally and by, research, by research you mean stalking me on the internet. I was following you. <laughs> it's creepy. Uh, but I just saw an article where you are the teen whisperer. Oh yes, yeah. That's uh, it's funny. It's Fox News was actually the the sort of folks that dubbed me as a teen whisperer, and they did it in a, in an interesting way. Uh, I was about to go on a live interview, and like five seconds before, you know, the kind of the host comes and sits down to greet you, and they're like, "So you call? They call you the teen whisperer? That's really interesting. We'll talk about that." And so <laughs> that was their first question. She says, "Josh, they call you the teen whisperer. Why is that?" And I said, "I didn't know that they called me that because when you talk about whispering into teens' ears, that sounds kind of creepy, like a guy like a guy who drives a windowless van." But but you know, I, I get the parallel dog whisperer, teen whisperer, and that's that's sort of what I do. You know, I help I help adults understand teens, and teens understand themselves. Very nice. I um, you know I, I ran across you actually when you ran across me. Maybe you were stalking me. I was, you know, I was, uh, I was you know, like most folks. I was loving and hating Infusionsoft at the same time. It was, a, <laughs> you know, a, a very uh, tumultuous relationship, and yeah, uh, you know, one of the look. I've I've done many many uh, s stupid things in my life. We'll get into that. Many many dumb things in business, but one of the smart things I've done in business is anytime I'm stuck, anytime I need a breakthrough, anytime. Uh, it, I'm in a situation like that. It's always best in the end. It saves you years, tears, and dollar bills to reach out to someone who's who specializes in that, who's been through that before, and can sort of help you overcome that. So, you know, that's 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 how I believe we initially connected. Uh, we did. So I appreciate the plug. Yes, sir. Um, but for for folks that are not familiar with you, can you can you give everybody a, a quick snapshot of of your business and and uh, what you do today? 
Yep. So kind of the heart of why I do what I do is that I, uh, my mom was 17 when she had me, uh, left me at the hospital. I immediately entered into the foster care system. By the time I was 14, I lived in a dozen different homes. 90% of the foster homes were amazing. Um, I was just a very oppositional, defiant, angry, like really, really angry, bitter uh, kid. Uh, uh, some of the homes weren't so great. You know, I was abused. I was, uh, yeah, I had food situations. I mean, just kind of a lot of crazy ups and downs. I was suicidal as a kid. Um, but then when I was 14, I ended up with a wonderful set of foster parents, uh, had a great mentor through Big Brothers Big Sisters, uh, some folks at the church and the community. So it kind of had, you know, this uh, all at once is sort of this handful of caring adults who refused to give up on me, on this kid who would try to just constantly push adults away and, um, you know, not really let anyone influence my life. But, but those handful of caring adults uh, truly changed my world. And, you know, my whole philosophy is that every kid is one caring adult away from being a success story. And I decided that I wanted to figure out a way to spend my life, you know, spend my career kind of in that space, doing that sort of thing, because those adults made such a difference in my life. Uh, and I, I knew and could deeply identify with whether you come from a perfect home or an imperfect home, being a teenager can be a pretty uh, tough thing because you have some serious pressures and struggles you're facing. But you also have limited experience, 14, 15 years on the planet. So that's kind of the heart of why I do what I do. Now, what I do is um, started as speaking, going around speaking to parent and teen groups. Uh, then I wrote a couple books. Uh, one of them is in like its 12th printing. It's called The Teen's Guide to World Domination. Uh, very parent parent approved, kid tested sort of book. Um, and then from that, I did a couple television shows, including most recently uh, a show with the executive producer of Oprah called Teen Trouble, which documented my work with uh, extremely at-risk teens. I'm um, doing another show right now with Dwayne The Rock Johnson that will be on TNT this summer where we're helping uh, a, a young person who, who needs a hand. Uh, and then from that, too, I begin to wonder, you know, how can I – scale my impact and my income because probably like a lot of individuals in service oriented businesses you know you commit yourself to excellence and really doing a great job at what you do uh, but there does come sort of a point in that journey where you have the fortunate um you have the for what would i call it you have the the fortunate slash unfortunate situation of realizing that you don't really own a business, um, but rather you own your job, and that for me as a speaker, uh, all I really had was a high-paying manual labor job. And if I wasn't willing to get on a plane every day, that limited my impact, which was most important to me, and it also limited my income, uh, which was important because we were about to have kids and I didn't want to you know, travel all the time. Right. So from that came sort of Infusionsoft and learning the world of marketing and where you and I sort of met and this and that. And, and then from that, now I have um, significantly scaled both impact and income, um, being able to serve you know, millions of parents, teens, and those that work with that audience, and also generating millions of dollars in revenue each year. All right. That's, that's a good point I, I want to jump on is that scaling the impact and the income. Yeah, um, you know, it's you do a lot. I know with uh, with churches and faith based, and and I, I see sometimes people that they'll use the Bible for and as, a, as an excuse, really for anything, right? But they'll they'll justify right. well, the meek shall inherit the earth. I'm supposed to be tiny and small and little and poor, you know. And then Jesus tells a story where the the, the three servants, right, uh, two go and double the money, and the other one buries it right and mm -hmm. and he throws him in jail right? He's yeah like, dude yeah. i gave you all this talent and you didn't do anything with it exactly you know that man that is really interesting because uh i was actually just having an interesting conversation with a buddy about this and to me my bottom line around income making money those sorts of things is that <clears throat> ultimately money is amoral meaning it's neither good nor bad right uh, you know it's ultimately 
what you do with it that matters. It ultimately matters, you know, what your motive behind acquiring the money is. To, and to me, that's why it's all about, you know, that the cash is merely a byproduct of the number of people you have effectively uh, and genuinely helped out or served. And so, you know, to me, I think I, th- I think those two are intertwined. I think, you know, whether you're in something that's kind of, you know, maybe, uh, you know, feel good based like my business or whether you're in something really, really black and white like accounting, I, I still believe those two are tied, that the only way you make more money is by effectively helping, serving more people, making their life better, right. period. So did um... – I mean, it sounds like you made a conscious effort to make a bigger impact and make more money. Was it yes. because of the family and, you, you know, you, that just kind of dawned on you? It's like, hey, man, time to make a change? Uh, yeah, great question. I'll be very blunt with you. So it was a variety of things. It was, number one, because of the way I grew up, one of my biggest ambitions, and, uh, and this is just the God honest truth, is to be an amazing father and husband. That matters more to me than anything. Now, I'm not saying my priorities always reflect that. I'm saying uh, deep in my gut that matters more to me than anything. And so as Sarah and I were about to have kids, I realized, man, like I'm kind of screwed here because – you know, I say that family's going to be a priority, but for me to, you know, earn a pretty decent living, I need to be getting on planes all the time and be away from home. And this isn't the man that I claim I want to be, but I really, really love what I do. I wish I could teleport. So part of the pain was in that. And then also part of the pain was in this, in that, um, you know, sometimes, Again, you, you have this mixed blessing of doing something for so long that you get really good at it. Right. And, I, and I got really good at the traveling around and speaking thing. And, and I'm certainly not saying that I'm a one-in-a-million speaker because I'm not. Uh, I just had so many dang at bats. I just got really, really good at it from just the repetitiveness of it. But also from that came sort of a uh, – it, it, it was enjoyable and very rewarding, both uh, to the audience, uh, monetarily, those sorts of things. But it was no longer a challenge to me. I would no longer get up on a stage and be terrified, or what if this doesn't work, or this or that. I knew pretty much, uh, you know, given extreme circumstances, that I was going to hit a home run. Is going to go well. People were going to dig it. Uh, kids would get a lot out of it. Parents would get a lot out of it. So I wanted to intentionally place myself um, back into a situation where I could be challenged and stressed and not know all the answers. And uh, you know, I just kind of became stagnant there. And I and I wanted some new challenges. So I wanted to figure out, you know, how can I scale this? How can I make this? Bigger than me, uh, not always about me. How can I, like you said, scale both that impact and income? So it was both kind of a family thing, and uh, I just wanted a challenge, man. Well, that, you know, Lee, I'm, I'm taking notes here, and then it looks like I've got this big uh, mind map going. Like, all right, how many questions can I get in? <laughs> <laughs> can we go for three days? Uh, yes, so, yes, in a row. <laughs> you know, so it's you, you talk about mixed blessing, being good at something. You know, I, we do a lot – uh, at Infusionsoft, you know, I've been around them a long time, and, and they do a lot with uh, Michael Gerber, the e-myth, yeah. right, and the entrepreneurial yes. myth. And he talks exactly. about how most entrepreneurs are really just doers. They're technicians, um, and it's, it's hard to let go, right, of being the doer of the yes. thing. And, that, and I think that's – I just wanted to kind of bring that out because that, that's what you're talking about. It, you, you were – it's a curse when you're the best one at it because then it's like, well, nobody else can do it as good as I can. And, and, and you and I are kind of the same, right? When you're a speaker, trainer, whatever, it's like they're hiring you. Yeah. You know, so you got to kind of carve yourself up. So I love the way that, that you start to reinvent yourself or, or expand. So can you, can you walk us through some of those kind of rubber meets the road? Like, you know, what did you do to to write a book or to get on TV and, you know, and, and take it to the next level? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and you're right. Anyone who has the capacity to become, you know, the choice, not a choice, you know, kind of like we're talking about there, someone who's just fantastic at what they do. You know, if you think, you know, accounting for small businesses that operate in this niche, it's like, you know, you think of this lady, you think of this guy, anyone who has a capacity to do that, 
um, you know, like me, tends to have some downsides in them, which means we, at least for me, I tend to be a perfectionist and I tend to be a control freak. Right. And so both of those are, as you know, and as others will find out or are in the midst of right now, both of those are um, blessings when you're when you're the one and all you got to do is control freak yourself and all you got to do is perfectionize yourself. But it is an enormous pain in the butt um, when you're trying to grow things, when you're trying to scale things, when you're trying to empower a team. Um, so for me, how I started was – saying, well, I don't want to go start up a whole new thing. So how can I – I grew up in Oklahoma, a big Native American community. One of the things I remember learning in elementary school, the natives, Native Americans were really good at, at what they called using all parts of the buffalo. Yep. Meaning if you know if we're going to kill a buffalo, we're not just going to you know take the meat and then throw the rest of the thing away. That's wasteful. We're going to try to utilize the horns and the and the fur and the, the meat. Like you know, we're going to max. We're going to use every single part of it we can. So I remember kind of thinking about that. You know, what is right there? What's the low hanging fruit? How can I use all parts of the buffalo? So there were two things. Number one, because I was quite good at speaking and doing those sorts of things. In my little niche, I had become an industry leader. Now, not outside of that, but in my little niche, which is possible for everyone within their niche. So I would have other speakers, other people who were established or getting into it saying, how did you do this? How did you scale things? How did you grow it? How do you get more bookings? How do you set up the process, this and that? And you have enough of those where you go, man, you know, I could probably put something together where I can pass on that wisdom and teach people. And so I started this thing called Youth Speaker University. And to me, that kind of checked both boxes of, hey, this is a way to make more of an impact because if these folks who are good-hearted and have good messages can get booked more, can get on stage more, and have their message heard more, then you know through them I'm able to you know get their message heard more. So, so that feels right there. And if I put together a premium product or program for this, um, then those that are serious will pay for it. So that's sort of an impact thing there. Uh, And the good thing about that is that that was completely scalable. That didn't require me traveling or this and that. You know, we could put it together online and on the phone coaching and these sorts of things. So that was sort of the first parlay into trying to scale, but also really kind of blooming where I was planted instead of saying, you know, I'm getting burnt out on traveling and speaking. Let me go start up a a cupcake shop. Right. (laughs) It's like, hey, you know, I I love 90% of what I'm doing. It's a travel that I hate. Right. So how can I leverage what I've worked hard on? How can I leverage, um, you, you know, this influence and experience and this and that into something else. So you speak your university was the first part of that. Um, and then as you take steps towards scaling, um, opportunities will present themselves and you got to be careful because sometimes it's shiny object syndrome and more is not better. Better is better. That's a big lesson I've had to learn. Um, more is not better. Better is better. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from you speaker university each year, I would meet one or two people who just blew me away. You know, so it's like anyone could join as long as they were willing to put down the financial investment. Um, But from, you know, each group of folks that would take the training, there would always be a few people who just blew me away. Their character was off the charts. Uh, They were a talented speaker who really, really cared, had, had a unique, entertaining delivery, uh, you know, they were just exceptional human beings and really good speakers, and I saw that they implemented the information they were getting. And so I thought, man, I have all of these booking requests that are coming in that I either can't do, um, they don't have the budget to bring me in, or or I just don't want to do it, um, you know, because my calendar's filled up and, and I, and I want to be home. So I thought there's got to be something in that. There's got to be a way that maybe I could – bring on a few of these folks and give them, you know, some business that I don't want to do. So that then essentially grew into sort of 
a little speaker agency where now it was no longer just me. It was like, hey, uh, you know, I wish I could do it, but I can't. Uh, but but here's someone that I've hand selected that that I recommend. Um, and here's a little practical, very very practical nugget. And uh, I would encourage everyone to ask this question as you hear me say what I'm about to say. How can this work in my business? The challenge, you know, is when you're the Josh Ship or when you're the Wes Schaefer. Typically, people want you. So how do you? How do you leverage your credibility to get people interested, but then sort of say to them, hey, here's such and such who I've trained, who is amazing, and I know you're going to love them. Well, we tried all sorts of tactics, all sorts of things. But but here is the best thing that I've found has worked is someone will say, hey, we want you to speak this thing. I can't. Uh, I recommend – yeah, yeah, Bakar. He's amazing. Here's a little thing we would do. We would we would have the person who was on the phone with that potential client say, Josh wishes he could do it. He can't. The one person that he would recommend to you is Yaya yeah, Bakar. Here's his site. Check it out. As a matter of fact, and here's the key. As a matter of fact, Josh is so confident that you will love Yaya yeah, yeah, and your audience will be blown away that if you're not, Josh will personally pay the bill. Now, what that does is that this potential client has no reason to trust option B because they were not brought into the funnel by option B. But they do trust option A, a.k.a. me or a.k.a. you, uh, because that's probably how they found out about your product, your program, your service. Now, practically, how Yaya and I have that worked out or any other speaker that I work with is I say, hey, man, this is what we do. Um, you know, I know you're going to do a great job, but maybe the one out of 150 times you go out there and, and it's terrible for some reason, you don't get paid, I don't get paid, no one gets paid. Are we cool with that? Right. Yes. Um, you know, but by willing to put my money where my mouth is, by willing to do that intentional risk reversal, uh, it gets a lot more of those clients to say, yeah, I mean, nothing to lose, absolutely. Right. Well, it's, you know, you gave us a lot right there. And I go all the way back to the beginning in that you, you know, you bloomed where uh, you were planted, right? The, you had the opportunity probably just literally hitting you in the face over yeah. and over. You're like, man, I just keep answering these same questions. Maybe I should charge for that. Right. You know? And so many businesses, like when I work with them, they, they struggle with writing. You know, because we always say, you know, come up with your frequently asked questions, but also create your should ask questions and create some type of guide, resource, something. People can opt in and get like, I don't know what to write. And I always tell them, go look in your out box. Go look in your sent items. You know, you have answered questions over and over to people, you know, spur of the moment, stream of consciousness. You know, how does this work? How would you approach this? And we have gold just sitting stored in our computers you know, hitting us in the face if we yeah. just recognize it and then do something with it. Yeah, you're right, Wes. I mean, I, I've written two books, and I can tell you that it's it's been a painful process because all this, you know, answering an email, we just think of that like no big deal, whatever. I'm just this person's asking me a question, easy. But when we begin to think it's a product or it's a program or it's a book or whatever, um, it we get we psych ourselves out and we get so dang intimidated that we think it's got to be academic and professional and there's got to be bullet points and, and all of this garbage um, that ultimately doesn't matter. And I would, I mean, I struggled with that when I was writing my first book. I sat down and all this pressure and it's got to be amazing and the first draft has to be perfect. But like you said, you realize you're answering these sorts of things all the time. You're having these sorts of conversations all the time. Uh, and for me, what was helpful in kind of that writing process was just you know pulling up those frequently asked questions and as you put it should ask questions and just audio recording or sitting down with someone who kind of fit the avatar of the the person that's going to eventually end up reading the thing Mm -hmm. and saying hey let's talk about this because you know if you're just sitting down having a conversation with someone you care about about something you care about 
that content is is just going to happen. It's just going to be there, and it's going to sound so much more like you and less like someone who's kind of paranoid and overthinking it and putting too much uh, pressure on themselves. So how did you go about promoting and filling up the youth speaker university? Because I know people are always afraid. They're like, oh, I don't want to do a webinar. What if nobody shows up? Or, you know, I don't want to host an event and, you know, have two people show and I look like a failure, you know, but you got to start, right? Um, so yeah. how do you get that first butt in the seat? <laughs> yeah, well, I think so much of what stops us from doing a lot of things that we claim we want to do is fear, yeah. ultimately. Um, you know, fear of what if it doesn't work, fear of trying to protect our ego. Um, and ultimately, you know, I think you just, you've got to do what's good for your, your business, not what's good for your ego. Right. Um, and so, I mean, the answer is simple and terrifying all at the same time, which is, which is just put a stake in the ground and do something. Uh, now it's challenging because for many people, they are 100% qualified to teach that webinar, teach that class, put together that thing, uh, just as I was on speaking in the education market. However, I was terrified to do such. I kept – because I felt like someone needed to give me permission. It's like, Mm. well, who the heck am I to crown myself and say that out of every speaker in the education market that all of a sudden I'm Mr. Fancy Pants and have all the answers? You know, I had so much fear associated around that. And what are these other speakers who are more experienced and older than me? What are they going to think? And aren't they going to blah, 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 blah. And you just, you just get in your head. You just get in your head. Um, and, and none of that matters. Um, will some people misinterpret your motives? Yes. Who cares? Um, will you perhaps have two people on your first webinar? Maybe. Who cares? Uh, really, to me, the only way be it a speech, a book, a webinar, anything. The only way you eventually get great is by starting with a decent first draft. Mm-hmm. Um, and here's a subtle thing that I see happening in our day and age. In our day and age, we have the we have the great fortune of the internet, and you can you can look at other people's sites. You can you know you can look at you know Wes. You can look at your site, or you can look at my site if you want to be a speaker. You can look at sort of people that are doing it well. And that can be inspiring. But here's the problem. It can also be discouraging because you're comparing your business now to my business now 12 years later. Mm -hmm. And it's just not a fair comparison. Um, Really, you know, if you look up to what Wes is doing, you need to go into the the uh, Google Wayback Machine and yep. you need to look up his site 12 years ago, and I'm sure he'll be horrified when you do such. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I haven't done it, but I'm but I'm sure it's terrible. Mine certainly was. Yeah. Um, and so, you you need to be careful about comparing your first draft to someone else's completed novel. Right. It, it's just not a fair comparison. It does not serve you. And everyone who today is awesome at something started off pretty crappy, right. um, but started off brave, committed, and just said, you know, I'm willing to struggle through this to eventually earn the right to be good. Yeah, I remember when I heard a guy first tell me that years ago at a, at a talk, you know, he says, you know, if you want to do anything, you have to be willing to do it poorly. Yep. You know, until you master it. And it's, you know, you look back and when we first learned to walk, we weren't very good. First time we learned to roller skate, ride a bike. I mean, we were terrible. Uh, but as adults, you know, we we get beat down. We get these ideas in our head. Oh, I, you know, I failed once. So I'm a failure. I'll never do that again. It's exactly. like, you know, were you really committed to that? You know? And again, kind of goes back to your stereotypical business owner and it, i'm and i'm i'm throwing myself on the stake with this it's that i am um you know i'm i'm a perfectionist a control freak and you know secretly insecure and so all of those things play against the idea of you know do something poor just do a crappy first draft just mm-hmm. get it started all that fights against that right cuz you go i just well I, i'm going to I'm going to hibernate in a cave for three years and craft this webinar, and then boom, I'm just going to, you know, release the kraken, and it's going to, you know, and it's going to be phenomenal. 
Um, but again, as someone who's been there and, and it just works out better, just just get started. Earn the right to be good. Just get going down that road, um, and, and then those improvements will come. Yeah, I had a guy ask me not too long ago uh, about something very similar, and I said, look, man, just, just do it. Right? I said, look, I have done webinars you know, where nobody showed up. And yep. I'm like, but nobody has to know that. Right? It's not like go to meetings, sends an email out. Hey, everybody, <laughs> everyone that was invited. Yeah, good thing you didn't show up. It sucked. Nobody, nobody you didn't miss anything. Right. I mean, yeah. So- also, yes. Also, <laughs> here are pictures of Wes naked as a baby in the tub. <laughs> but this guy looked at me, you know, like like that, you know, the dog with the tilted head. You're know, like, huh? You? You? You know, I'm like, yeah, dude. I mean, it, it's just do it. You know, yeah. you, and and when you put that stake in the ground, what will happen is. Two minutes before you go on, you'll realize 18 things you should have done before that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so at least you can write those down. So the next time you'll have those, the, the 28 things you did do and the 18 things you didn't, you can add them all up to have a better one next time. Exactly. And I, and I think that's exactly the right mindset. I think, you know, I think your first product, your first webinar, your first whatever is ultimately more about what you learn than about what you earn. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's not perhaps the answer everyone wants to hear. They want to think that the first time out you're going to have the best seller or the runaway product or you're going to fill up the webinar to capacity. Uh, but it's really more about what you learn. And then really the goal should just be incremental improvement. You know, if the first webinar has eight people, great. What went well, what, did, what could have gone better? Um, you know, then let's bump that number to 12. And if you continue that incremental improvement, you know, whatever that metric is for you, I'm not saying it's number, it might be, uh, you know, things sold, it might be action taken from the audience, whatever that metric is, look for that incremental improvement um, and and celebrate that. Right. So, so getting back to how you how you got that uh, university started, did you did you kind of pre-sell it? Did you float the idea around people? You know, did you have like some beta users that got in at a discount? You know, yeah, good, good question. So, what it is today is not what it was initially. So, sure. and I don't even just mean in in quality of content and sort of a refined message. What it is today is basically three components: online training that's dripped out um, twice a month. A, a monthly on the phone Q and A coaching call with me, and then a live workshop um, in California. So that's what it is now. What it was when it started was basically I rented a uh, meeting room in Dallas, Texas, and eight people came. Eight speakers came. I think paid a thousand bucks a person, and uh, it, it was just kind of two days of of me talking and basically saying, here is literally everything I've learned. Here's everything I've done well. Here's everything I've done poorly. Here are the contracts I use. Here are the scripts I use. Here's kind of just everything. Take it, do with it as you will. Um, And to me, if you're going to put together something that's going to be a program and kind of um, scalable but locked, I think it is a mistake to craft that product in a cave meaning I'm I'm very glad one of the things I did well, one of the few things I did well early on is I'm very glad that that first sort of workshop was in person. Right. Because, you know, those questions and, well, what about this? And, but you know, what if I don't live in the United States? And what about the subtlety of this uh, really helps you more deeply understand uh you know, sort of what they're going through, what their unique circumstances and frustrations and situation is. So I think having that live in person, you know, having being able to get that positive feedback, but also having those individuals be able to sort of poke holes in the content that you're trying to teach is really, 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 really helpful, particularly early on. Right. Because sometimes you unfortunately, and again, this is to compliment all, all, of, all of you listening to this, sometimes you unfortunately think people getting started are just as smart and fancy and driven as you are. Um, and that is sometimes the case, but not always the case. Sometimes what you take 
for granted of like, no, you know, just do that, blah, 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 is a really big, mind-blowing, uh, intimidating concept to them. Right. And you need to slow it down and break it down and hold their hand and hug them as they're snotting on themselves and say, you'll be okay. This is pretty easy to do. Let me show you how. Right. Yeah, I see that all the time, especially in, in this world of, of Internet marketing and technology. You know, people are like, yeah, well, just go get you a virtual private server and uh, upload your, you know, the Linux install and then, you know, put the WordPress theme on there and then go ahead and edit the CSS. You're know, like, what? Exactly. <laughs> What's a hosting? What? Oh, OK. Let me let me slow that down a bit. Yeah, I think, man, I think the more I, I think early on, you know, so if you're someone who's thinking about, you know, this is something I want to do. You know, I would challenge you. I think one of the best pieces of homework you can do uh, early on is deeply, deeply, deeply get to know the individuals that are going to be your potential buyers. Um, what are their dreams? What are their aspirations? What are their hang-ups? What are their roadblocks? Um, you know, what drives them? What really drives them? All of this sort of thing so you can understand both both what they want to learn which ultimately becomes your sales and marketing, but then also what they need to learn. And frankly, those are often two different things. You know, your average beginning speaker wants to learn about how do I publish a book? Mm -hmm. Dude, you're not going to publish a book if you don't have a platform, if you don't have an audience, if you don't have your message figured out. Like none of that's going to happen. Uh, you know, what they need to learn is what is their message, who is your buyer, defining your message, delivering your message, all those sorts of things. Uh, so, you know, kind of think through what is it what is it that my potential buyers want to learn, which is your marketing, and what do they need to learn, and that's ultimately the content. Right. And um, so those are good nuggets that can hold on to. And I want to kind of shift a little bit. One of the articles I read – uh, was in your empowering parents. It yeah. was how labels stick to your child, uh, you know, and how it affects behavior. And but I want to kind of apply that to adults, you know, if, if you could, because I see so many people um, that have hangups about whatever uh, they didn't they didn't go to college, you know, or and a lot of people in California uh, they lost their homes, right? They had the short sale or foreclosure, even a bankruptcy. And, and they're labeling themselves. Uh, and I just see so many people with so much potential uh, letting these labels hold them back. Uh, how, how can you help them? Or what, you know, what words of wisdom do you have for people to get over that? Well, I, I mean, first of all, I completely understand it. You know, I, for me, for so many years in my life, I, I had those labels stuck to me of, you know, when I was, you know, as a kid, you know, you stupid, fat, pathetic, punk, foster kid, you know, no wonder. I mean, I literally had kids say to me, parents, you know, or adults say to me, no wonder your mom gave you up. No wonder your mom gave you away, um, you know, and then failures and bullying and all of these sorts of things. Uh, and those labels can – the interesting thing to me about this whole concept of labels – is other people can't see them, but they they whisper to you in secret. Mm -hmm. You know, they whisper to you when you're thinking about starting up a new venture or doing something different or shifting things. You know, they whisper to you, what are you, what are you thinking? You know, remember last time you tried to do that, it didn't work out. Uh, you, you don't have what it takes. You're not the go-to expert. You're not qualified enough. You're not smart enough. You're not... You don't know enough about technology. All of these sorts of things are just fears and lies um, that are trying to keep you safe and mediocre. And so the question is, how do you break through that? You know, how do you push past that? Well, I think a few things. I think number one. And this is something everyone can afford to do. Uh, you need to find one or two people who who inspire you, and you need to get around them once a week. You need to try to get around them once a week. You know, maybe these are people who, 
you know, whose family life is going really well, and you could use a dose of encouragement in that. Maybe this is someone whose business is going pretty well, and you could use a dose of encouragement in that and have those conversations about how did you grow things and how did these sorts of things start to happen. Because when you put yourself intentionally around those sorts of people, um, they will begin to change what is normal to you. You know, as you hear about the things they're dreaming about and the things they're struggling with and how they get through them, uh, you know, that'll really be encouraging to your situation and will begin to re- remove those labels. And then the second component of this is that you have to take action on doing something that's good for you that scares you. Um, you know, I, I believe there's no such thing as self esteem. You know, self esteem is, it sounds like something you're either given at birth or you're not. Uh, I I believe it's more accurately step esteem, as in S T E P, mm-hmm. meaning each step you take towards something that's good for you, but that genuinely scares you, uh, the bit more confidence you're going to have, regardless of the outcome, regardless of whether or not you do the webinar and two people show up or two hundred. The fact is. You stopped overanalyzing, stop listening to those voices, those labels, and you took action. And now what your mind begins to do is you begin to go, I wonder what else I once thought I couldn't do that maybe I actually am capable of. Right. Uh, and, and man, I, I think that is so important because the reason people you admire are where they are is not because they leaped to there. It's that step esteem. They took little step after little step, scared along the way, failure along the way, doubting themselves along the way, all that stuff that you may find yourself in a situation uh, being in right now. But they continued to step. They continued to take action. They continued to move down that road. Yeah, I think it was Zig Ziglar that said, you know, hang around successful people even if you have to shine their shoes. Absolutely, man. Because <laughs> uh, it, it does it just builds on you. Yeah, and you know, to me, one of my one of my big philosophies in life that I've learned the good way and the hard way uh, is that wishful thinking is not a strategy. <laughs> yeah. You know, you it's important to be positive and hopeful and optimistic, but it's not a strategy. You know, just sitting around hoping things are going to improve in your family, in your business, in whatever, in your health. Uh, that's not a strategy. That's not going to force you to take action. So yes, be positive, but also have a system in place, a strategy in place. Uh, you know, do you have someone in your life who's going to lovingly harass you if you don't take action on the things you claim are important to you? Right. You know, all of these things are little things uh, that matter that most people don't see, but that most you know, quote unquote, successful people that I know, uh, do behind the scenes. Right. Um, well, that is fantastic. Um, any, any parting words of wisdom, uh, for our listeners? Yeah, man, I would, you know, again, just think back to, to what is my next step? You know, looking at, at where you're at and where you want to be, uh, think about what your next step is, not where someone else is, not where you were, not what failed, not what didn't go well, um, but clearly, clearly define what your specific next step is. Um, and once you've defined that, then get training and accountability around that. Um, really, the end destination, that you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is a shiny thing is a thing that's fun to fantasize about or think about. But ultimately, if you don't take that next step, um, you're never going to make it to the promised land. So I think it's really important for folks to clearly identify what is my next step and then get the education you need around that next step and get the accountability you need around that next step. Um, Because some some days you wait, and man, this is true for me. Some days I wake up and I feel awesome and like I can do anything and I'm productive and I can – You know, just conquer the world. And some days I wake up and feel like, you know, I'm the dumbest person on the planet. Uh, And that's just going to happen for everyone as human beings. Right. 
And that's why you need that accountability. That's why you need someone encouraging you to take action even when you don't, quote, feel like it. Um, and that's what it's about, the next step. Right. And um, your home on the web is Josh Ship, right, with two Ps? Yep, uh, joshship.com. Josh .com, and uh, they can find you there, your Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, everything from there. And, you bet. Um, and buy your books, do all that good stuff. And all this, the links will be uh, in the notes here. Um, but, hey, thank you for sharing this. This was uh, quite uh, impactful, uh, powerful. We got kind of deep. Uh, it was some good stuff. Cool, man. Thank you, Wes. My pleasure, buddy. All right, man. Have a great day. Yep, you too. I warned you we were going to get deep, didn't I? Uh, how you like his opening? Um, every kid is one caring adult away from being a success story. And you know what? I think that's true for adults as well. I think a lot of us, uh, all of us, there's still a big kid trapped inside. Uh, there's something uh, that is unfulfilled, an itch we've got to scratch, something uh, that maybe is holding us back or something that makes us feel unworthy. Uh, so surround yourself with people, you know, listening to this podcast and others like it, uh, is a good start. Uh, it's a great way to augment and supplement, uh, your training and your confidence building and your skills, but, you know, find somebody, uh, that you can retain as a mentor. You know, uh, Josh said, uh, earlier on, uh, what was it? Tears, years and dollar bills or something like that. So that's why he finds somebody. Uh, that has the expertise that can help. Uh, and so find somebody that can hold you accountable, uh, that can be that caring adult, right? That caring, nurturing uh, mentor to help you grow. We all need that. He also talked about money. You know, money is amoral. It just it, It's a representation, a convenient medium of exchange, right? It's a representation of the value you provide to society. Uh, I talk about that in the seven deadly sins of selling uh, people being uncomfortable with money is one of the biggies. You know, it makes my list of the top seven. Uh, he talked about, you know, give yourself enough at bats. You've got to get out there and be willing to swing and miss and keep swinging until you hit it. Okay. But then once you are competent and confident at making uh, the hit, uh, don't get comfortable. Right. You've got to continue to push yourself. And again, that's where surrounding yourself with caring adults, uh, individuals that are intelligent and smart uh, and can push you and pull you and compel you uh, will help you go to the next level. All right. So uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, go back and rewind, uh, take some notes and take action. If something moves you, stop the player and go do it. Okay, I don't care if, if you don't listen to the rest of the podcast. Uh, grab that one thing, take action. That's the main thing I want you to do with all of these podcasts. Okay, uh, so if you're still listening and you want some books to read, check out wesaudiobook.com. Uh, you'll get a free uh, download there. And if you want to check out a sample of my new book, check out 79stories.info. It's the number 79 stories.info. And as always, thanks for listening. Please leave a five-star comment at, at iTunes. Uh, leave some comments on the blog. Again, this is session 42, the saleswhisper.com slash session 42. Thanks for listening. And remember, sell different.